So D23 has come and gone, and after thinking about it for a while, I can honestly say that I was pretty underwhelmed by all of it. I can't help but feel that the people who are in charge of both the studios and the parks are completely losing sight of what made both of those things so very, very special in the eyes of countless millions of people throughout the past century. Basically at D23, the Disney convention that comes every two years, when really it should be every year, they announced various upcoming film projects as well as updates and additions to their parks, resorts, and cruise lines. And while there certainly were plenty of things that got a lot of very positive reactions from audiences, chief among them being an entire land dedicated to Disney's iconic villains, which was no doubt meant to compete with Universal Studios' upcoming Dark Universe Park, there were also some announcements that made people very uncomfortable and kind of angry. So getting right into it, the entertainment panel, in my opinion, was totally awful. And by totally awful, I mean that pretty much everything that was announced was either a sequel, a spin-off, an expansion, or a remake. And out of all of those, only a fraction of them were for stuff that was actually for Disney's in-house animation studios. Meaning that if you're not a fan of Pixar, Marvel, Lucasfilm, or Avatar, you're basically fucked. And for that stuff that is from in-house Disney, all of it is just sequels to revival era films anyway. So if you're a Disney animation fan, you basically now have to go through Frozen, Zootopia, Moana, and Encanto all over again. Here are all of the original products that were announced. Of these, three of them are Pixar. And I don't know what the hell Monster Jam is supposed to be. All I know is that Dwayne Johnson has got his big giant hands on it. And seeing as how audiences are quickly starting to grow tired and bored of his shtick, I don't foresee this being that big of a success. Maybe at the box office, but culturally, nah. And then here is the list of all of the sequels and spin-offs and remakes. The only thing that's even kind of really original is Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man. But really, that would just count as a reboot. I mean, how can anybody look at all of this and feel remotely confident? I mean, you've got Pixar slowly succumbing to the whole CalArts bean mouth art style that you see everywhere on television these days. And then you've got the live action remakes for Snow White and Lilo and Stitch, which even if you didn't have all of the baggage surrounding Rachel Ziegler, you would still have the equally abysmal track record from Disney's live action film remakes. To this day, the only one that is really regarded as being any good is Cinderella. Maybe Alice in Wonderland from Tim Burton if you count it. I mean, you'd think with all of the attention that they're giving to Tiana with the retheming of Splash Mountain to her Bayou Adventure, they would make a 2D sequel, but nope. Now speaking of sequels, I know this might be a very controversial opinion, but Disney seriously needs to go back to making direct-to-consumer sequels. I'm certainly not against the idea of them making sequels to their more successful properties, I just think that they're doing it in the worst possible way. As some of you older fans may remember, once Disney was able to release their products on VHS and DVD, they soon started making direct-to-video sequels that they could just simply skip past theaters with and into the homes of families around the world. The great advantage of this was that the main studio could focus all of its time, attention, and resources on making new and original films one after the other while smaller teams such as Disney Toon Studios could focus on making the direct-to-home sequels and possibly a spin-off cartoon for television. And so if you were a very strong fan of any one particular film, there was a very good chance that you could get a sequel film or television show. Granted, they might not be on the same level of quality, whether it be the animation or the writing, but they were, for all intents and purposes, out of everybody's way. They were just for you, if you think about it. For example, Aladdin was very, very successful during its run in theaters. It also had two direct-to-video sequels and a television cartoon. It even later had a Broadway play that was also fairly successful. 
But because these things were all firmly removed from theaters, moviegoers don't feel like they always have to be catching up with whatever the newest release to the Aladdin franchise is. Heck, you could be a fan of Aladdin just by virtue of being a theater geek. Now Disney is doing everything it can to release as many sequels as possible to theaters, with a giant advertising juggernaut behind all of it. And not only does this eat up a lot of time, money, and resources, but it also eats up a ton of goodwill from audiences, creating what is known as brand, brand fatigue. Now it feels like everyone has to hear about Frozen 3, and The Incredibles 3, and Cars 4, and Zootopia 2, and worst of all, Toy Story 5. Like seriously, all of these movies should just be Disney Plus exclusives. That way you're creating better value for the customers who are paying for your service. I mean seriously, people fucking rolled their eyes at the announcement for Toy Story 5. And people are becoming increasingly resentful for how this franchise is continuing because we kind of don't want it to, at least not in the way that they're doing it. Toy Story 3 felt like a conclusive end to the franchise. But then they continued it with Toy Story 4, which, you know, was really pushing it, but at the same time, the ending to that film still felt like a fairly conclusive ending to the franchise, albeit fairly open-ended. But now they're making Toy Story 5 with the plot being around, oh, they're meeting technology. Um, I'm pretty sure that we basically already covered this in Wreck-It Ralph. Hell, I'm pretty sure we already covered this in the brave little toaster. I've never seen contraptions with so many buttons and knobs and dials before. Naturally, we are on the cutting edge of technology. And fans are rightfully frustrated by it. This is one of the reasons why I think people have a lot more respect towards Tangled and Big Hero 6, because they had one movie and then they had a spin-off cartoon series that you could watch on your own free time. With all of the money spent on the Disney remakes alone, we probably could have had enough quality 2D animated films to fill up two more Disney renaissances. I just really wish that Disney wasn't wasting all of its financial and social capital on things that either appeal to people who are not creative or worse, are creating and fostering a media environment in which lack of creativity is not only rewarded, but encouraged. That is the worst thing that they could possibly be doing. And the Parks panel wasn't really any better. Now, I will be more than happy to give praise to Josh tomorrow for doing probably the smartest thing that he could do in that moment, and that is not talk about any blue sky productions, but rather talk about things that were either in active production or things that were shovel ready. If this was his audition to replace Bob Iger when he eventually retires, I think he nailed it. But even though we didn't get any pie in the sky ideas, we got two things which were arguably worse. IP dumping and not expanding. Basically, they're just dropping shit all over the place without any care for things like flow or theming or immersion, namely in California Adventure and Hollywood Studios, also that they can promote franchises that already print money for them anyway. I mean, how many parts of Disney World and Disneyland need to have fucking Monsters Inc. in them? It won't be long before they have an exhibit in Animal Kingdom and tell us, no, actually, this was going to be Beastly Kingdom the whole time. And just like the entertainment portion the night before, if you don't like Pixar, Marvel, Lucasfilm, or Avatar, you are fucked. There were next to no announcements regarding their Disney Animation Studio stuff, at least not anything that isn't fairly recent. You see, as a millennial who grew up during the Disney Renaissance and was a great enjoyer for films such as Beauty and the Beast, Hercules, Mulan, Tarzan, and yes, especially Atlantis and Treasure Planet, which I will happily consider to be Renaissance era films. I and so many other people like me feel completely left behind. This is starting to feel more and more like it's just an amusement park dedicated to stuff that Bob Iger bought rather than a theme park dedicated to all of the stuff that Walt Disney imagined. 
I mean, say what you will about Eisner's later years, but during his tenure as CEO, he had a ton of big and bold ideas that were absolutely in line with the greatest hits of Imagineering. I mean, if anything, it would be a lot more beneficial to the parks to stop treating them as dumping grounds for IP and started seeing them more as IP themselves. You'll probably remember all of the movies for things like Mission to Mars, Tower of Terror, Pirates of the Caribbean, Haunted Mansion, Country Bears, Tomorrowland, Haunted Mansion again. All of these movies were based off of rides. One could argue that Inside Out is just a loose adaptation of Cranium Command, hashtag free buzzy. But until they had movies based on them, the only way that you could experience these rides was to, you know, go to the parks and experience the rides. The same thing goes for stuff like Space Mountain, Horizons, and Enchanted Tiki Room. These aren't generic roller coasters that you just simply slap a character on like they do at Six Flags. While there certainly have been IP-based attractions at the park since the very beginning, that IP was already meant to supplement a ride that was already utilizing unique artistry or mechanical engineering, such as the scene in Peter Pan's flight where you fly over London, or the massive treehouse dedicated to the Swiss family Robinson. Now it feels like more and more rides, be they IP-based or not, are being replaced with rides that are specifically meant to be advertisements for Disney's more popular IPs. As in they're really only there to entice guests, in particular young children, to want to purchase merchandise at the gift shop. As if audiences have no sense of creativity, culture, or originality, and can't enjoy a ride or attraction on its own merits alone. One of the most egregious examples of this is Maelstrom at the Norway Pavilion in Epcot. Once a showcase of Scandinavian folklore and history, it got converted into Frozen Ever After, which basically recounts the story of the hit movie, but it doesn't really represent Nordic people or culture in any meaningful way. It would be one thing if they had a character meet and greet in the Norway Pavilion during a certain time of day, but to imply that the pavilion in Norway doesn't have anything going for it other than a loose retelling of a movie just because that movie made over a billion dollars is both an insult to the people of Norway and to the sensibilities of park guests. If I wanted to see Frozen that badly, I'd watch it at home. What was easily the worst announcement related to the D23 Parks panel, and I say related to because they waited until several days afterwards to tell us, is that they were going to take the Rivers of America and Tom Sawyer Island portion of the park, located between Frontierland and Haunted Mansion, drain it, excavate it, and bulldoze it so that they could not only fit in the aforementioned Villains Park that I told you I was excited about earlier, but also a large area modeled off of the American and Canadian Rocky Mountains. Now, I'm not at all against expanding Frontierland to include such a place, even for the sake of showcasing IP, because not only does this type of setting fall in line with the idea of the American frontier, but there are also thankfully a lot of really good Disney IPs that relate to this setting, namely things like Davy Crockett, Country Bears, Paul Bunyan, etc. But we're not getting that. No. What is this area going to be dedicated to? Cars. Yes, this area is basically going to be a giant racetrack for cars. Kind of like those races that they have throughout Europe where they drive through the woods. Now, there are several major problems with this. Firstly, the Rivers of America, Tom Sawyer's Island, and the Liberty Bell steamship that goes along it are not only meant to be symbolic and representative of America's rich history and literature, something that Walt Disney was a great admirer of, but they are also meant to be representative of Walt Disney's design philosophy. That there should not only be places where people ride exciting rides, but also places where people can relax and decompress, take in a beautiful view, maybe indulge in a healthy dose of edutainment. The Rivers of America provides negative space for people to enjoy. I mean, think about it. 
The only way that most people can reach Disney World is by car. So after all of the countless hours spent in traffic trying to get there, do we really expect parents to want to spend close to two hours waiting in line just to ride a car again? Do we really expect five-year-olds for whom the track is mostly made for to want to wait two hours in line for anything? Planning and executing a vacation in Disney World is already stressful enough. Why not give people a chance to just relax? And best of all, enjoy the cooling effect that the river brings to the area. Florida can get very hot, and without that river, it's going to get a lot hotter. Two, Disney has been on a very strong environmentalist kick as of late, promoting the importance and conservation of wildlife, particularly marine ecosystems. You see it everywhere in places like Epcot, where they have Living with the Land, The Seas with Nemo and Friends, Moana's Journey of Water. Then you've got all of Animal Kingdom, which added an area dedicated to Avatar, which also has a very strong environmentalist message in that too. Then you've got Autopia converting to electricity in the coming years, finally culminating with all of the hubbub surrounding Splash Mountain being renovated and rethemed into Tiana's Bayou Adventure. To drain a river and bulldoze an island? To make way for a ride dedicated to gas guzzling cars and trucks? Just screams of tone deafness, especially given how more and more people across America are becoming increasingly disgusted and averse to car centricity within their towns and communities. Like, it grosses people out. And then thirdly, Disney Park fans, of which we all know there are many, have been growing increasingly distasteful towards Bob Iger's seeming obsession with just simply scattering and dumping IP all throughout the parks, regardless of theming or even ride quality, which not only disrupts the immersion that made these parks so fantastic to begin with, but also goes against what Will Eisner referred to as the Disney difference meaning that for the price that guests are paying, they should receive an experience that is the ultimate in quality and creativity. Coupled with the near endless deluge of sequels and spin-offs that I mentioned earlier causing lots of brand fatigue, you're not only seeing this negatively affect their returns at the box office, but you're also seeing negative returns at the Disney parks as well. Sure, Little kids may enjoy rides dedicated to Cars and Frozen, but those kinds of rides don't really leave the lasting emotional impression that's going to keep those people coming back into their teen and adult years. Not simply to just reconnect with their childhood, but to also then pass down that torch to their kids and maybe even grandkids. If Radiator Springs or Frozen Ever After closed, people might shrug their shoulders people might be disappointed. If Journey into Imagination or Space Mountain closed, particularly in favor of an IP-based attraction that does not fit in Epcot, there would be picket lines. And we know this because it's happened. Now with all of that out of the way, I do kind of want to mention some arguments that I've been hearing online in favor of this that I think need to be addressed. The first is that, well, nobody goes there. It's not popular. Well, the sad fact of the matter is that you can't visit everywhere in Magic Kingdom in one day, which is often how much time that families allot themselves when making a trip to Disney World. Because not only is there so much to do, but for each thing that you do want to do, many times you have to wait in a very, very long line to do it. Or you have a small window of time to do it if you're using any of their express lane systems. Rivers of America and Tom Sawyer's Island aren't less visited because people don't like them. They're less visited because people have to already wait 30, 60, or even 90 minutes for rides and attractions that have already been hyped up as must-see, mandatory e-ticket rides. And when you're paying a lot of money to go there in the first place, there's this sort of sunk cost fallacy that ends up combining itself with that hype. Really, it's more so a case of people being afraid of missing out on Space Mountain. But Rivers of America and Tom Sawyer's Island are appreciated 
and valued. Maybe not by foreign guests or new Americans, sure, but even if there are people who have to wait in line elsewhere, they're still happy that such a place exists. Then you'll have people say, well, isn't this a park for kids? No, it's a park for families. It's a park for everybody, which means that you have to appeal to multiple age groups. Like I said, while a car's ride may excite kids in the short term, they're not really the type of things that's going to stick with them into young adulthood or into middle age. They're not timeless rides that people will look back on with nostalgia or hope for the future. Like Walt Disney said, children don't have money. The grown-ups are the ones with the money. I guarantee you, any kid who's a big Cars fan would just as easily get excited over anything else within their periphery in that spot. These are not rides that the children seek out. The people who look ahead of time to see what kinds of things are available to do are the grown-ups, and waiting in a super long line in the hot Florida heat and humidity where there once was a peaceful river is not that appealing, especially if they're already swimming in Cars merchandise at home. This isn't something like a princess meet and greet where you get to witness your little toddler think that they are face to face with the characters that they meet on screen. Your kid is experiencing a car ride, just like how they experience car rides basically everywhere else. It just comes across as really short-sighted and poorly thought out for a theme park to do this, all so that they can appeal to a select amount of people within a very, very short time window. Number three, well, they have to bulldoze it. The area is looking really, really rough, especially the boat. Oh, wow. If only Disney invested a ton of money in large boats. I mean, you really expect me to believe that these people, during all of their immense cost-cutting measures that they implemented during the COVID and post-COVID era, weren't totally okay with letting this area go to shit just so that they could have an excuse to bulldoze it later? No. Fix your shit. Clean it up. Get a new, nicer looking boat. Maybe make the island look a little bit nicer. You have the money to create a villain's land. You have the money to expand frontier land. You have the money for four giant cruise liners. How much money did Dial of Destiny cost again? How much money did the Acolyte cost to make? And you're telling me that you don't have the money to tidy up a fucking river? I mean, the worst part is that this isn't even an expansion. This is just a replacement. All of the announcements that were made were just replacements. They're not expansions. So it's not like Disney is creating value for the price by making their parks bigger, especially in the face of Epic Universe. It would be significantly smarter for them to put the Cars ride to the west of Big Thunder Mountain and then have the Villains Land be directly above Fantasyland. That way, not only could we have all three areas, thus satisfying everybody, but you would also have an additional benefit of simply diverting all of the major crowds who want to go to the new Cars ride and all of the major crowds that are going to want Villains Land and have them be as spaced far apart as possible. But with this way, you're placing two monumentally hyped rides in between two already popular areas. So what's going to happen? Ridiculous crowds, ridiculous lines, all in ridiculous heat. And then this isn't really an argument per se, but it's something I've been seeing a lot. It's this whole situation where you get people who, I don't know if I would call them shills, but they get extremely defensive when you criticize Disney's business practices. How dare we question them wanting to just simply feed us all of this uncreative, focus-grouped, corporate slop, and how dare we ask them to be more creative, seeing as how their title is Imagineer, especially for the increasingly exorbitant ticket price. And it's not just that they're getting extremely defensive, there also seems to be this almost glee in the idea that Rivers of America and Tom Sawyer's Island and the Liberty Bell are being deemed irrelevant, that people are saying 
that nobody cares. They seem to really revel in the idea that people like us are getting to see something that they love and cherish and have some sort of attachment to be not only gotten rid of, but abandoned and destroyed. In my experience, these people tend to skew a lot younger and they've grown up in a media environment where they can't really wrap their hearts around the idea of media that is sincere or artistic or genuine or charming. And instead, all of the stuff that they've been exposed to and grown up with is all cynical and ironic. And it shows. I believe that if Disney is at all serious about surviving and thriving well into the future, it should work harder to cultivate future generations of fans like this Adventure is out there. instead of turning the children of today into this. But those are just all my opinions. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more like it, by all means head on over to my Patreon where you can support me for as low as $1 a month. Every video I include a shout out for one of my Patreon subscribers and today's shout out goes to Chris aka Baby Yoda. Thank you very much Chris aka Baby Yoda and thanks to all of you who have watched my videos. Hope to see you all again in the next one, but until then, this is Jay Brad, signing out.